Welcome to the Deep End by On Deck, a podcast where visionary builders, creators, and experts discuss world changing ideas. I'm your host, Marshall Kozlov. Let's dive in. I always come back to this word ownership. I think it's the simplest way to think about Web3. If you create value for a network, you should be able to capture the value that you create. I think traditionally when we interact with social media platforms, we're a big consumer of content. You know, we get followers, we get likes, we get impressions, but there's no way for us to share in the growth of the platforms that we're using. And so fundamentally, I think the biggest unlock for crypto is allowing users to earn assets in the form of tokens that represent ownership in these networks and communities. And when you start to ground yourself in that principle, you start to realize that there is no difference between a core team and a community. That ethos should be one and the same. And as you start to blur that line, you notice that the path to contribution becomes much more fluid. And as a result of that, you notice that people are much more engaged in what they're contributing to because they now have a sense of ownership in those responsibilities. deep end, we're creating a space where we skip the surface level and go in depth into ideas that inspire people to build. I'll be your guide as we explore possible futures of internet communities, creator tools, climate tech, longevity, and much, much more. There are no experts in uncharted territory, only pioneers. The deep end invites these trailblazers to turn their experience into knowledge and ideas that others need to start their own founder odyssey. Joining me this week in the deep end is Cooper Turley, known on tech Twitter as Koopa Troopa. Cooper leads a handful of online communities known as DAOs. DAO is an acronym that stands for a decentralized autonomous organization. In plain English, a DAO is an internet community with a shared cap table and bank account, which means DAOs represent humanity's newest structure for cooperative decision making. Cooper joined us for a live episode last week to help explain why DAOs are exploding in popularity. In our discussion, he explained their governance structures, described the different types of DAOs, made some predictions for the future, and answered some wide-ranging questions from our live audience. Cooper used a lot of words to describe DAOs, words like supranational, permissionless, and fluid, but the one that struck with me most was inevitable. DAOs are a powerful new mechanism for coordinating humans at scale. If they work as intended, we could be seeing the rise of a new way of organizing people that might last for centuries. Before we get started, a quick reminder that we have two live episodes coming up in the near future. First, Dr. Emily Anhalt is coming on the show tonight at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to talk about building a gym for your mental health. You can register for that live event at luma slash COA. That's L-U dot M-A slash C-O-A. Additionally, on October 12th, Karthik Puvada will join us to talk about no-code tools. KP is the program director at OnDeck for our no-code fellowship and loves to encourage his fellows to build in public. He'll discuss how system thinkers can harness technology to solve the world's most pressing problems, no coding required. Register at luma slash no-code tools. That's L-U dot M-A slash no-code tools. All right, that's all for now. Let's dive in. Cooper Turley, welcome to the deep end. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Jackson and I, our producer, were debating how much coverage we wanted to give at the start in terms of what's a DAO. I think most people here in the audience are going to know that it's a decentralized autonomous organization. But what I love about your writing, and I really want to push to everyone, is that to a certain degree, you capture the philosophical parts of DAOs really, really helpfully in a way that makes it a bit more tangible than just the more technical side of things. So I'm just going to start by reading a quote of yours and would like you to reflect on it, which is that DAOs are internet communities with shared cap tables and a bank account. Yeah. I'd love to hear your thoughts there. Totally. I think that DAOs are the new LLCs. I think that crypto is operating in a fundamentally different atmosphere now. And what DAOs provide is a layer for internet communities to coordinate together in a really exciting manner. And so for me, I'm less focused on the technical capabilities of DAOs. I'm more focused on sort of the ethos of community ownership, of giving governance back to token holders and members of a community. And then when you think about the technical layer, I think that crypto tools and governance seats are just one way to help coordinate humans. And so as I think about DAOs, I think about 
what are ways to get people to coordinate together online? And I kind of see this thing DAOs as like the best way to start a company moving forward from now through the end of history. I love that you went to the end of history part because you really write down three different parts of this as providing members with a voice through governance, flattens hierarchies, but it allocates resources to advance a core mission. And this is the part that I, at a research level, have the least clear understanding of. Can you talk about the core mission aspect? Absolutely. So every DAO will have a different core mission in the same way that every company has a different core mission. DAOs are basically a way to coordinate like-minded individuals to solve some common goal. You know, what that goal is can range from anything from a grant giving organization, which is sort of the earliest DAOs that we saw. So basically put money into a pot and allocate that to people in need. To now we're seeing more for-profit DAOs that are starting to resemble more for-profit companies where communities are coming together, they're building products and services, they're earning on-chain revenue from selling NFTs, from selling membership passes. And I think across the spectrum, what you see is that all DAOs have this core focus of a community treasury. So basically one wallet that's custodying the vast majority of funds from that community, and it allows the wider members to vote on the distribution of those funds using a governance tool like Snapshot. And so traditionally in companies, you'll see shares do have voting rights associated with them. Most people would never vote with the stock that they hold. But with DAOs, you notice that token holders are much more excited to participate in those conversations because those votes are much more meaningful to them. I'd love you to go through the different types of DAOs. So you went at the you went at, you went at the grants fund, but what was go down the line? Let's go to what's a protocol DAO and then an example of that, and we'll just keep going down the line. Absolutely, a protocol DAO is a DAO that executes on-chain transactions on the back of governance. So I typically like to think of protocol DAOs in the terms of DeFi. So something like Uniswap or Compound, there is a DAO which controls the vast majority of the token supply. And any time that there is an upgrade made to that protocol on a technical level, there is a governance vote that's submitted. And should it receive uh, enough votes and reach quorum and pass by majority, this means that that action is going to be executed on chain. So the DAO is literally a smart contract that's executing actions on behalf of token holder actions. Um, it's basically the primitive for all these larger organizations that are bil managing billions of dollars of capital. You know, there's a lot of nuance around the edges in terms of these changes being pretty substantial. And so you see protocol DAOs as a way to maintain, sustain, and upgrade these giant organizations that are managing billions of dollars of capital. Investment DAOs. Investment DAOs I think of as collective um, contribution pools. So basically pulling capital together to make investments into early stage companies. Typically they're investing in crypto native startups. So they're either receiving tokens in return or they're investing in safes that are going to convert to tokens. That's not to say that investment DAOs can't invest in uh, traditional equity, but I think the fabric of them is basically allowing you and a hundred of your closest friends to pull together a couple million dollars of capital and make collective decisions to invest in early stage companies. And then the more, I never heard of this one, the service DAOs. Hmm. This is my favorite because this is actually where I got my start in DAOs. Um, we live in a world where crypto native companies are being built every day. You know, the, the tooling, the coding languages being used, the communication strategies, the community building, it's all fundamentally new primitives. And so what service DAOs are, are basically global collectives of freelancers that are organizing across the world to go and work for other DAOs and other crypto projects to help build the next generation of Web3 technology. Then social DAOs, these are the more obvious ones, obviously. <laughs> Yeah, these are some of my favorites. It's the ones that I spend the most time on today. I would see social DAOs as advanced social clubs. The TLDR is you hold some asset and that provides you with access to some given community. You know, typically those communities offer you access to IRL events, to special presentations, to lifestyle brands, to, you know, um, gated ticketed events around the world, and basically a way for you to just make friends online. But under the hood, this is very different from a traditional membership in the sense that you actually are a partial owner in that community. So whereas you see something like Soho House where you pay a fixed annual membership fee, with a social club, you'll typically own an asset that represents access and ownership to that community. But should you not want to be a part of that community anymore, you now have the ability to go and sell that on a secondary market or on the reverse side to capture the growth of that community as it scales because you hold an asset that represents ownership in that collective. And then two last ones to go down the list here, which is very comprehensive. We've got collector DAOs and media DAOs, the one media DAOs being the one I'm most personally interested in, but let's go through the collectors, then hit media before we move on. Collector DAOs, I like to think of as NFT DAOs. You know, what you find today is there is dozens and dozens of high blue chip assets in the NFT world. So you think about things like CryptoPunks, um, Fidenzas, art blocks, you know, one of one pieces on Super Air, you know, basically assets that are going for 
millions of dollars online. Autoglyphs, I think, is a great example of this. And typically, one investor does not have the capacity to collect that at scale. And so what you notice now is that dozens of high-profile NFT investors will come together and pull their capital to be able to collect higher value works. Um, I don't think that this is limited to just NFTs. I think collector DAOs can also start to resemble investment DAOs, where they're making investments in different protocols, products, and services. But for the most part, when I think of collector DAOs, I think about a group of highly competent NFT collectors pulling funds to collect high value work. And finally, for media DAOs. Media DAOs are ways to crowdsource contributions to media outlets. You know, I started my career in crypto as a journalist. And so when I look across the board at how I'm releasing my work, typically I'm releasing under a brand that is getting notoriety in the space. Um, I'm either getting paid on a per word or a fixed rate basis. But traditionally, I don't really have ownership in that organization, which is fine. This is how you know media outlets have operated for, for decades from a freelance perspective. But what media DAOs do is they kind of flip that on its head by offering liquid ownership in these collectives for contributions. So if I come to a media DAO and I want to start writing stories for you, if I want to start going to bat for you or covering uh, events and festivals, there can be incentives in place such that I can earn ownership in this community for the value I create in the form of written or vocal content. What's so helpful about, and this is all pulled from one of your pieces, what's helpful about this is you can't hear these six plus different examples and not understand this idea that we're barely just, we're not even scratching the surface of where this could all go. Like all of these different categories, there's different applications, there's different setups, there's different people of the community that would join here. But what I enjoy about speaking with you about this topic on is the fact that you've kind of hit different parts of it. So like you just said, you came into uh, the space because you were just writing first. So it'd be good to just go through um, the basic pattern of you writing first, gaining more social capital, getting interested in governance. Like, let's start with just like the writing part of the journey and how back in 2018 you were thinking about it that way. Absolutely. It's a fantastic question. I'll quickly caveat that um, breakdown was from a post of mine called The Dow Landscape. You know, that was written about three to four months ago. I think on that chart, there's about 100 DAOs. And if I were to go back and write that today, there would be double to triple as many as on there. So since that post has been written, this has been absolutely exploding. And the thing that I am most excited about is helping people get into DAOs because I think that it's the single greatest opportunity, but it's currently very difficult to do so. And so using my personal story as an example here, I came into the space. I was completely self-taught. I graduated with a music business degree. And so entering crypto, I did not have a lot of technical skills to bring to the table. But what I did have for music was the ability to connect with people and really share narratives and stories. And so when I entered the crypto space, I thought about, you know, where is my value at? And to me, that was through writing. You know, early on, this is working with projects on sort of wider story arcs and brand building. And then as I got more deeper into the space, I recognized that reporting on news was a really valuable source. You know, it allowed me to be front and center for a lot of these new projects that were being released. It allowed me to get paid while I learned. And so I was typically writing for um, a bunch of different DeFi outlets, covering fundraises, covering protocol upgrades, you know, covering different partnerships and whatnot, and really just helping to provide an eye on where I thought that value was occurring in the space. And through that, I was able to start working my way into these different DAOs and organizations as a contributor and as a communicator. So if your team was releasing a fundraising announcement, if your team was releasing a protocol upgrade, you know, I would tap in for a sprint where I would basically come to work with the team, you know, bang out a couple articles here and there, and then be seen as someone that was able to help distill that down in the form of a tweet storm to kind of build a community and evangelize the ideas that you were working on. So I didn't realize that you had a music business degree. This may seem like a total tangent, but this is going to matter for context. I'm friends with Jared Dicker. He's been on the podcast before. He actually came from a music business background too. Before the Huffington Post, he was trying to be a freelance music reporter. Do you think there's a, t what's the, what's the narrative tie between people who are interested in the 21st century, crazy disrupted music industry and the crypto space? It's curation and culture. These are the two topics that I am most fascinated by. And time and time again, I see people from the music world coming into the space for that exact reason. On the curation side, I think that music really rewards people who are early to discover talent. And on the culture side, I think that there is no industry that's more vibrant for you know, brand notoriety, attention, fame, celebrity, whatever you want to call it. There's sort of this cachet with music that's really alluring to people. And so when I think about crypto today, I think about how do you invest in culture? And when you look around the edges at how you do that, People who are strong curators are often able to signal to value in a really meaningful way. And I don't think it's a coincidence that a lot of the people who are super big into music are now starting to make a really big name for themselves here in the creator economy. And just the last 
bit on this here. What do you think the opportunity in the music industry is with this broader crypto Web3 conversation? It's community ownership. You know, um, earlier today, we closed the crowdfund for one of my friends, Daniel Allen. We did an advance of 50 ETH to basically help with the release of his upcoming EP. This is a brand new artist who's coming out, building a name for himself. And I think what you're noticing is that fans really want to invest in the projects that they know and love. Traditionally, those opportunities have been gatekept to labels and to larger players. And now with crypto, we're basically disintermediating what it means to be able to uh, financially and socially contribute to these opportunities. And as a result of that, I think you're going to see that artist to fan relationships are going to get much stronger. And when people are releasing songs and content, those fans are willing to go out and really advocate for it because they now have both a financial and a social incentive to make it pop off. Let's get philosophical for a second. The problem with discussions on anything Web3, DAO, NFT related is that everything's kind of hypothetical to a certain point, which is makes it a really fascinating space. And it's why you could go from 100 DAOs to three times that in a two-month period. So that's an exciting space. But what I just noticed is that even technically focused people are having a difficult time of comprehending this exact Web 2 to Web 3 transition we're making. So I'd just love to hear from you before we get more deeply into the DAO aspect of this. What, How would you articulate this moment we're going in late stage 2021 and what it means how people should think about it at a higher level? Mm -hmm. I always come back to this word ownership. I think it's the simplest way to think about Web 3. If you create value for a network, you should be able to capture the value that you create. I think traditionally when we interact with social media platforms, we're a big consumer of content. You know, we get followers, we get likes, we get impressions, but there's no way for us to share in the growth of the platforms that we're using. And so fundamentally, I think the biggest unlock for crypto is allowing users to earn assets in the form of tokens that represent ownership in these networks and communities. And when you start to ground yourself in that principle, you start to realize that there is no difference between a core team and a community. That ethos should be one and the same. And as you start to blur that line, you notice that the path to contribution becomes much more fluid. And as a result of that, you notice that people are much more engaged in what they're contributing to because they now have a sense of ownership in those responsibilities. A question I'm obsessed with asking folks who are at the cutting edge of Web3 topics is, how do we avoid having our imaginations be limited by Web2 constraints? So to make an example, social media wasn't a message board. The New York Times, when they went online in the 1990s, all they did was take the paper newspaper and put it online without adding any actual value. And it really took 15, 20 years to actually add that value here. So how do you just as a, a builder, think your creator in the space, think about, or just advise people to just not just say, hey, like let's just make Facebook and add tokens to it. How, how do you help people or how do you personally try to think beyond just trying to replicate older things with like a vibe or newer sheen to them? I think it's about opening up access to those opportunities. You know, I think traditionally when we think of a startup, the only way to meaningfully contribute to that project is to get hired on a salaried basis and have sort of a long-term formal vesting agreement with the team. You know, as you start to really break down what it means to work on something, you know, I think this uh, this transition from work to social life, you know, I very much see them as one and the same in my life. And I think right now we live in a world where you work during the weekdays, you close your computer, and then you have a social life on the weekends. I think for crypto projects, I really challenge teams to think about what is the combination of those two things? You know, where are worlds where people are coming together on the back of what they're working on? And if we can create incentive mechanisms to allow people to feel really empowered and free to spend their creative energy on things that they love, I think you're going to start to notice that people are much happier with their day-to-day -day lives because they're spending their time working on things that really mean something to them. That's interesting, especially given the reconceptualizing what the week versus weekend looks like part. So we, we, we keep talking about ownership. The next easy pivot from there is just this topic of governance. Because once again, if you own something, you have an ability to influence its future. That's why the distinction you made between just owning a tiny amount of stock in Disney and actually owning at a governance level really means something. So on two levels, let's ask this question. So part one would be just give a framework for how people should approach governance. And then two, since you do a lot of advising people in the DAO space, how do you just advise they think through this concept of governance and how that relates to ownership? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a topic that I'm fascinated by. I'd say for governance itself, it's two-parted. One, it's the ability to participate in existing conversations. 
So if there is a proposal from a community to make a change to it, you should have the ability to directly contribute to that conversation. That takes the form either in voting. So you go to a snapshot page and you press yes and say, yes, I agree with this. And it also takes the forms of like active contribution. So typically these DAOs will share working documents or trains of thoughts, and you can pop into a Discord server and kind of contribute your thoughts and opinions. And I think that ability to participate in a very meaningful level beyond signaling is really important. And to your question about advising people, I think it's unrealistic to expect everyone in your community to participate in every governance discussion. I think that governance is really a standpoint in transparency. It's basically saying, hey, as we make critical decisions in this community, we are going to keep you in the loop on those conversations. That's not to say that everyone has to have a meaningful role in influencing that proposal, but making sure that they see that in advance of a snapshot vote, making sure that they know what's going on and that they're aware of what's happening. Um, I think that it's far more about having key operators who are competent to drive critical conversations and allowing there to be transparency around those conversations, more so than it is about making sure every every one of your thousand token holders adds a comment to a Google Doc, which realistically is never going to scale and you're never going to get anything done. Can you speak to what a snapshot is? Absolutely. So Snapshot is the primary governance tool used across most DAOs today. This is an off-chain voting platform, which allows you to submit a proposal and allows you to vote with your tokens on that proposal. So the reason I use that word off-chain is when you submit a governance vote with Snapshot, you don't have to pay a transaction fee. If you hold tokens in a wallet, you can go and press yes or no to vote on something without having to pay a transaction fee. I think this is really important because for a long time in the early stages of DAOs, everything was happening on-chain. You know, back to my description earlier about protocol DAOs, if I'm managing billions of dollars of capital, it makes sense that all of my decisions should happen with an on-chain transaction. But if I'm in a social club with 50 members, me having to spend $100 in gas to vote yes on where we should go to the park today does not make any sense at all. <laughs> and so what Snapshot did is it really unlocked this world of governance where it's a lot lighter in weight. You know, there's nothing actually being executed on-chain when that vote passes. It's really used as a reference and a signal. And so these communities are basically using Snapshot to solidify proposals and then putting trust of execution of those proposals into the hands of three to five to maybe 10 core contributors who are going out and enacting on behalf of that proposal's decision. Something I'd like to go a bit deeper on, pardon the pun, is just how voting actually operates. Because I think too often in these conversations, voting is just sort of put forward. But as we all know, in our real lives, voting is, there's a million different ways you could vote. There are different systems. So can you speak to the actual systems that have popped up, opportunities for expansion, changing, scaling, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. So what I will say is that there are now dozens of products and companies being built around governance tooling. You know, any given week, I'll see probably two to three different people that are thinking about things like um, snapshot voting. So governance voting itself, treasury management. So being able to utilize assets that sit in the community contract, um, different community operating frameworks. So things like token gated discord servers, different chat layers, different working group standards. And so all that goes to say that there are dozens of tools on the table. And when I think of governance, I think about how do you piece those tools together to make really meaningful change in your community? And so what does that look like? I think it starts from an idea, someone saying, hey, I have a great idea for this community. Let's go ahead and start a Google Doc amongst all of us to really flesh that out. Someone will spin up a Google Doc, we will start a group call with someone to come and say, noon PST on Thursday, we're going to talk about this proposal. People pontificate on it, they add ideas to it. That key owner then synthesizes it into a written document. Typically, that'll go into a community channel like a Discord and say, hey, we're having an ongoing conversation about this cool proposal that we're doing. You know, come on and join the conversation. There's a little bit of rounds where people are stepping in and contributing here and there. Um, typically, people will take it to a town hall. So as something kind of bubbles up the chain and it becomes something more meaningful, those DAOs will say, hey, we have this big proposal. There's been five to 10 people working on it. Keep it on your radar. We're going to toss it up to a snapshot vote. After there's been that transparency that I talked about and the opportunity for people to contribute, typically then it will go to a snapshot vote which is basically taking those weeks of working group conversations and boiling it down into like a 500 to 700 word um, overview of everything that's happening. You know, that snapshot vote will go live for 48 to 72 hours, in which case anyone with tokens that community can vote on it. And once that's passed, it's then on those key contributors to go ahead and execute on the back of it. So they'll go out, they'll actually make the transactions if there are any necessary, they'll build the products and services. And you'll kind of have this full circle loop where what started as that idea got contributions from everyone in that community. It was then ratified and stamped on using a snapshot vote as the tool to do that. And then over time, you're going to wake up one day and notice that the brainchild of me at 2 a.m. is now the core operating system for the community that thousands of people are using every day. Let's 
get to a debate producer Jackson and I were having beforehand that actually gets to something you said earlier, which is that you described DAOs as the next evolution of the LLC. I wonder to what degree are the type of companies, projects, missions that are organized in, let's say, a traditional LLC, a traditional startup, and nonprofit, to what degree are all these styles of governance competitive, complementary, or is this just a situation where you see us waking up in 2050 and we all laugh at the idea of ever having OOCs and obviously they're organized along the lines of a DAO? How do you think about how an ecosystem exists? I think a lot about crypto native communities. I think the only difference between a DAO and an LLC is that everything from a DAO is happening on chain. So from funding distributions to salary payments to governance, there is an entire ecosystem of tools that allows you to make meaningful decisions on a blockchain like Ethereum. I think the structure of an LLC makes perfect sense. And the reality is most DAOs are operating as LLCs or C Corps under the hood. But this is only because we do not have the infrastructure in place to support meaningful on-chain actions for DAOs from a legal and tax perspective. So when you think about getting $10 million of USDC into a DAO treasury, how do you pay taxes on that? You know, How do you open a bank account? How do you do the most basic things that every company needs to operate? You do that by setting up an LLC or a C Corp. And so right now I see these traditional entity structures as basically a meaningful way to really scale and operate a DAO. But that is only necessary because we're so early in this conversation that those exact rails have not been built on crypto yet. But as you start to extrapolate out over five to 10 years, what is a bank account? A bank account is an on-chain address. And as people start to accept payments in the form of crypto, I think you're going to notice that the traditional structures are being phased out in favor of more crypto native solutions. Why is that necessarily true? So for example, what if it just turns out that I like having control over my thing? Why would I want to inherently? So let's say I don't have an ideological bias or preference for community, those different parts of it. Why would folks in non-crypto worlds, for example, spaces that aren't crypto native right now, why would they want to transition to this model? It's a great question. I think um, transparency and efficiency would be my main takeaway here. So you can start a token and control 90% of it. There's nothing saying that you have to lean into community ownership. I think that's just a state of how early and ideological the DAO space is right now. But the reality is that most companies are going to conform back to traditional standards over a five to 10 year time horizon. And so the difference here becomes the lack of um, borderless blockage. You know, if I'm going to hire someone across the world, I no longer need to go through traditional banking rails. They can send me an Ethereum address and in two minutes I can send them $500 to work on my next project. If you want to make an investment payment, you know, I can't tell you the amount of time I've spent having to drive down the street to Wells Fargo to make a, a wire to a company I'm angel investing in versus them sending me a USDC address and me pressing send in two seconds, that job being done. And so I think that it's really a matter of how we operate online. And as this world becomes more digitally native, which I'm a strong believer in that happening, I just think that, you know, DAOs and sort of like crypto native standards are going to be more suited to scale faster. Can you speak to what is the work that needs to be done to make this entire process more accessible? So you think back in the 1990s, which I was barely alive for, obviously, people could dunk on America Online for being lame and being a playground that was gated. But what it actually helped do is it helped bring straight up normal people onto the internet before they eventually graduated, which wasn't great for the business long term, but at least short term, that was the function. What do you think? if at all necessary, the AOL for this space would be? Better onboarding. I mean, I think that it all comes down to how quickly it takes to get started with crypto. When you think about using all the best pieces of crypto today, you need to be comfortable using a non-custodial wallet like MetaMask. And that to me is fundamentally broken. You know, the fact that I need to set up a wallet, uh, write down a 24 word seed phrase, make sure that I never lose that phrase ever. I need to go to Coinbase, buy Ether with USD, transfer that Ether to MetaMask. I need to then go to a contract, approve the contract, edit the gas limit, press confirm. I mean, this is like, we are we have so far to go before this is really meaningful. You know, my belief is when crypto is mainstream ready, I can pick up a crypto wallet in the same way that I download an app on my iPhone, within five minutes have all the necessary assets and approval ne needed to be able to like get started and make meaningful impact in this space. The part that, once again, we were prepping for the episode we were so fascinated by is considering once again, DAOs within almost historical framework. So you have, 
from a pure humanities evolution anthropological perspective, you have the family band, you have the tribe, the agricultural um, town, city state, nation state, corporation, feudalism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Each evolution is sort of moving forward in a different way. So I, I'd like you to speak to the implications of the DAO. Right, because in all these previous structures, which to certain degrees have been superseded by different ones, there is a different notion that came with it. So just how do you think about, as we're looking at the space expanding beyond the hypier, vibier part, how do you think this is actually going to, quote, Packy McCormick, because he did a great piece on this, like change the way that we're investing, creating, and playing together in an increasingly digital slash in real life world? Yeah, I love to use this term teal organizations. I think it's a great North Star for every DAO to shoot for. The way I like to think about this is every member of your community is able to self-identify the role and the compensation that they want for the work that they do. I think that in a traditional work environment, you are given a clearly defined set of tasks and responsibility, and you are paid a fixed amount for completing those asks. I think in the world of DAOs, there is no longer a long-term time horizon commitment you can come in and work on a project for two weeks and earn some tokens and then never come back to that DAO again. But I think what you notice is the fact that there are fluid on-ramps to contribute to these communities. Once people step into the weeds and they start working with their friends and shipping really badass products, they start to notice like, oh, the money I was making for my traditional DAO doesn't really stack up to the sense of fulfillment that I got from working on this internet community. And as these internet communities come more valuable in the sense of the tokens going up, in the sense of the treasuries becoming more plentiful, um, the ability to contract highly curated talent is going to be more and more accessible. And everyone who has highly competent skills is going to notice that they are no longer beholden to one major company. You know, they are in control of their own work destiny. And I think that's going to unlock a lot of new collaborations and work streams that we haven't really seen before. I'm really interested in two words or phrases you used there. So one, you referred to shipping products and two, you referred to skills. Obviously, you're coming from a technical tech slash crypto background, but that's where my inherent skepticism directs me to. How much is this going to apply to quote unquote other parts of the economy? At the same time, the other problem though that I will note is it's easy to say back in the 1990s, oh, that's just the tech space. Everything's different. But the clear story over the past 30 years is that there's no real such thing as a, a tech company and a real company. Everything becomes everything together. So can you try to bring together the mishmash of dual-sided opinions I just threw at you? Because I recognize yeah. on a historical basis, there's a lesson to be had from that. There absolutely is. Um, I put out a post called The Rise of Microeconomies. And the reason I highlight this is that I think mom and pop shops are perfect case studies for DAOs. You know, the fact that you can have a brick and mortar shop that has a very simple responsibility of selling bread every Sunday can be a perfect example of something that can become community owned. I don't think there needs to be an expectation to ship software for you to be operating as a DAO. I think when you think about this world and you think about the customers you have and the revenue and the profit that you're making, um, trying to transition away from that only going back to the, the hands of a few small stakeholders into this sort of wider community vehicle. I think this is why you see local coffee shops becoming such a staple in communities is because there's a sense of ownership in that space. You're meeting people there, you're having great conversations. You know, Typically there's good loyalty programs, but a lot of the time that value stops at the social level. So I can go there and be known as the guy who every morning I come in at nine and I get my coffee, you know, my exact order, which table I sit at, et cetera, et cetera. But as that coffee shop starts to scale and do well, it has a couple more locations or it starts to expand its team or whatnot. Um, I'm basically tied to that one physical location. And so when I think about DAOs and the sense of ownership and belonging, I think about upside associated with the communities that I spend time in. And as you replace this term product with basically value, you know, as value is created, how do I share that amongst my members? I think you start to realize that this scales to basically every community in existence. And it's really just a matter of those owners taking the plunge to want to share that with their community members. So this is helpful. And it ties it back to your own personal story. What are the different roles, whether it's the one to the two week one to the longer term one that are filled within a DAO? So to the coffee shop example, obviously there's the owner of the coffee shop, there are the baristas, but just expand out the different roles that folks could be filling during this process. My favorite one is the DAO operator. You see this as basically every DAO's first hire. This is the person responsible for coordinating all of the DAO members. So doing things like scheduling town halls, doing things like writing newsletters, doing things like doing the at everyone command in Discord. There are specific people who are responsible for the day-to-day -day coordination of that DAO. 
And I think what you notice is given that these DAOs are all internet native, they're all global 24 seven, you really need someone at the center of that to make sure that all of the attention is being pointed into the right direction. And so that's the one that I'm most fascinated by specifically because it only requires human skills. There's no technical skills required at all for it, but it's an incredibly powerful position because if you're able to coordinate and have social skills, you can become a person of very high influence in these communities. And traditionally the compensation associated with this is becoming extremely competitive and extremely profitable for people who are really leaning into it. Going back to the community point, I'm interested speaking to, let's say, let's speak to your journalism background at a narrative level, how we should think about this. Because if you're thinking of, let's say, post 19th century, 20th century histories of companies, industries, it's very much about an individual. It's, um, you know, Elon Musk and Tesla and SpaceX. It's, you know, Steve Jobs of Apple. Every single industry is going to have its own example of this. How do you think that top down model? compares to community driven bottom up bottom up ones and what are the pluses and minuses of either system because i think we can both recognize that in certain situations there's advantages to both mm -hmm. i think it's about speed and efficiency you know i like this quote if you want to go fast go alone if you want to go far go together i think that DAOs allow people to contribute in a really meaningful way across the board but the result of that is that things move very slowly so in that earlier example i mentioned about a community proposal that process typically takes anywhere from two to four weeks, let's call it on like a, a rough off the cuff guess. So if I am building a product that needs to have feature upgrades every single day, it doesn't make sense for me to need me to ask my community members, should I patch this bug in the product? It's like, no, it's an obvious answer. Go ahead and get that thing fixed today. And so when you have more of these top down organizational structures, I think you can move faster. And I think that you can be more lean in how you sort of navigate the ecosystem. But what I think you lack to have and why we're seeing such a push towards DAO now is that when you are making those changes, it feels less meaningful because people aren't kept in the loop on them and they don't feel like they were participating in those conversations. So if I ship a product and it's the best product in the world, it doesn't really matter if there's no one around me to really experience that. But when you're building from a bottom up mindset and you're a community that's building product, even if it's a really shitty product, people are really going to go to bat for that because they're like, hey, I helped with the copywriting on this front end or I helped with the font we're using here or something like that. And those really small, meaningful changes actually have significant influence over community involvement. And what we're seeing with crypto now is that communities that are highly active in communities or highly active in these crypto projects are allowing these assets to become highly valued relative to what they're actually creating. The reality is that a lot of these DAOs have no on-chain cash flows. They don't have a lot of revenue, but they have a thousand people who are extremely passionate about a given social club. And that is now being valued at $100 million. You know, and I think that fabric is fundamentally different from anything that we've seen before, but it sets a really high precedent that if you're a founder and you're building with your community, you can create a lot more value than I think what we've seen in the past. I want to highlight that because going back to your microeconomies piece, this is what's so exciting about the moment. I mean, everyone I'm sure has heard the or seen the Ben Smith, New York Times piece about Aussie media and them like overly inflating their numbers and being obsessed of saying we have 50 million impressions per month. What's cool about this space and that you're really capturing your piece captures this idea that with a thousand people, you can actually do something really substantive. So that's going to focus things on the one hand that goes to the whole, you know, creator middle class, which, you know, we could, we could talk about it, but it also speaks to just the, the idea of driving more value per user or engaged community members. So I, I think that's just really helpful to pull out. Mm. Yeah. Just to add some commentary there. I would say that crypto is about the quality of individual community members rather than the quantity of members itself. And so traditionally, when we look for success on a platform, we look for the number of followers, we look for the total amount of impressions, the amount of engagement. But I think for crypto communities, Going deep on relationships and responsibilities for individual members has much more upside associated with it. And so I actually think using metrics like MAUs and sort of these daily numbers don't really matter because when you look under the hood, you know, a thousand members that are contributing actively to a community on a day-to-day -day basis can contribute and create exponentially more value than a hundred thousand people that are scrolling past something and they're never even thinking about it for a second. They're just like passively consuming content that's put in front of them. Not to put ourselves too much in a box, but what would be the better metrics, quote unquote? So timing, time engage, like engagement percent. Like how how would how should we think about better metrics than just sheer number of people? 
It's a good question. I think um, capital contributed per user. So how much value has this person put through the system? So whether the amount of uh, volume they've put through a given platform, you know, typically when I'm designing airdrops for protocols, we'll think of this term called GMV. So what is the fixed dollar amount of value that's been created through the services being offered? I think that's a great one to take a look at. I think governance participation is a really good one to look at. So how many people have voted in this community? What percentage of token holders are actually participating in governance decisions? And then retention. I think that there's a lot of stuff to be learned from Twitch and how they sort of do like one year subscriber, you know, I've been a subscriber for six months, you know, um, prime subscriber, whatever it might be. So more like social tiers and reputation around how long and how deep that person is in that community, I think is much more favorable than just simply looking at the number of heads that are in a given server. Let's get to the last section before we transition to audience participation. Speaking of the theme of the episode, quick note for everyone, just in terms of time, remember to keep your questions and to use this time to keep them decently short so Cooper can engage and then also other people can engage as well too. Let's speak to the actual title of this episode, which is just the full-time DAO, which is what you are doing. Um, good way to summarize. No salary, no healthcare benefits, um, no 401k, just ownership, more specifically that equaling tokens. Speak to the model that you're living and then obviously promoting in terms of the way you're living your life now. I will start by saying that I'm very fortunate to be able to undergo this type of work. You know, if I had not been in crypto for five years and had success in this industry, I think it would be fundamentally different from the way that I operate today. Um, having found myself in a good position to work on the things that I love, you know, I am far less concerned with having a fixed income on a monthly basis and far more concerned on getting fixed ownership allocations and projects that I really know and love. And so typically when I'm working for these communities, I will look at opportunities to earn ownership stakes in them, you know, whether that's launching the token, writing a blog post, taking notes at a town hall, you know, doing these menial micro tasks that allow me to earn five to 10 tokens over time. You can basically use the analogy that I am working for only equity in all of the communities and the companies that I am working for. And so it's a very weird notion. You know, liquidity in the space is very challenging. These tokens go up 10x, down 10x. You know, a lot of times they don't have much liquidity. There's a thousand dollars in a Uniswap pool and you can't even trade it. But my long term horizon here is that carving out ownership stakes in these internet first companies will be an extremely profitable and extremely crypto native way to operate. And my goal now is to take those assets that I've accumulated and create better systems for me to be able to live on the back of them using things like borrowing markets, you know, DeFi protocols like Aave, doing things that are much more crypto native so that it's not about me having to sell my tokens to pay my rent. It's about me being able to use those as productive assets in an economy and have borrowing leverage against that to be able to sustain and, you know, pay my bills and cover my rent. My last bit here, and I'm not saying this to poke any holes in the thought experiment longer term, but when I'm going through that list, no salary, that makes sense. Um, 401k ownership actually solves for a couple of those issues. The one that quite doesn't track is the healthcare one. So the <laughs> actual question, because once again, like your goal is to engage like with, with tokens specifically. So the question is, how should we think about spaces where the legacy system is most likely to remain entrenched in the sense yep. that the 401k to token swap pretty straightforward. There's no quote unquote permission there, but I just definitely don't see a system where healthcare is going to be taken care of or receptive to that part of it. There's a bunch of yeah. other legacy issues of healthcare at whole. So how should we just, so take the question to the meta level, how should we think of the gap between legacy and the future? I think there's two parts here. I think one is that crypto companies are working on making this easier for people in my position. So if I'm someone who needs healthcare, there are now DAOs in place that allow me to become part of a collective and have those benefits. I think the wider uh, conversation here is around self-sovereignty. So I think today we live in a world where we expect our employer to cover a lot of different things for us. The challenging difference here is that I am now responsible for covering all of my own bases. And this also means things like getting healthcare. And so as I'm an individual traversing this world, I now need to think about setting up an LLC for myself, setting up some sort of protection, you know, making sure that I'm basically covered from an individual standpoint. And the challenging thing there is while it's much more exciting to be flexible across all these communities, there is a lot more pressure and reliance on myself to be covered because no one else is watching my back for me. It's entirely on myself to make sure that I'm abiding by the rules and doing everything in the systems that exist today. The follow-up here, and this is where I wonder, I'm putting on my most normie hat possible. What do you say to people who are pretty satisfied 
with the system. I'm coming from a traditional media background mm -hmm. and I'm just like, look, I don't care if it on deck pays my salary. I get equity. I have healthcare. I do podcasting on the side. So I'm doing the creator economy thing, but I don't really need to change that much. To what degree do you think people directionally like me are going to be able to be comfortable in the status quo? Or is this not really up to everyone in the long term, just given the efficiencies and the dynamics you're talking about? My short answer is power to you. I'm extremely happy for you. It's not my job to sell you on why you should be involved in crypto, but if it is something that becomes exciting to you and you can start to see the benefits for living in a digitally first world, I am here to help guide you and lead you along that way. The reality is I don't think it's for everyone. I don't think that everyone should be handling non-custodial wallets. I don't think that everyone should be poking around in deep governance tools, but being able to build deeper relationships online is not going to go away anytime soon. So I would highly encourage everyone that's in that position to simply just pay attention. You know, this isn't happening because it's some fluke in the pan. There are really meaningful technological movements happening here. And to blatantly ignore that as a result of complacency or comfort, I think is very naive relative to where this industry is headed over a 10 year time horizon. So ask the, to, to ask the question more succinctly, to what degree is the world you're describing inevitable? Right. So to 100%. what degree on that's okay. So that's, that's the hundred percent answer. Okay. Noted for all of my fellow Luddites, this is inevitable <laughs> to a certain degree. I think that's going to be very place. different though. Very yeah, different. Yeah. I'll just and add one, uh, one quick comment there. Um, it's going to be very, very different in five years. I think right now we're in an opt-in world. We need to jump through a ton of hoops to get involved. I think in five years you'll wake up and this will just be the fabric underpinning everything. And it'll be less a conversation of you taking a leap of faith into the deep end and more so you just being surrounded by these tools every single day. That is such a helpful place to put it because just to put a bit of commentary, what you're really getting at is as I'm articulating the reluctance to engage in the system, most of what I'm reluctant around isn't the idea, it's more of the mechanisms. So there's an opportunity to improve mechanisms and evolve further there, which is where you could solve a lot of the mental baggage for people. But I think that's an excellent time to transition to the Q&A section. I know, Jackson, some of the first questions wanted you to read it, so please take over and go from there. Sure. Yeah. I am acting as the liaison for a person who is so interested in the future that their handle for this conversation is what's next. So this nice. person has several questions. I'm going to go with the first one, which is, are you aware Cooper at all with how like traditional players think fang companies, big media organizations, how aware are they even that DAOs exist? And is it something on their radar in terms of a threat? They are very, very aware. All of these companies are actively hiring crypto divisions to go and build out this infrastructure into their platforms. I think to the question of whether or not it's a threat, that depends on each individual company. But I would say across the board, all major companies are very aware that this is happening and actively hiring competent individuals to build out these solutions into their products today. Awesome. I, I think the natural follow-up to that is like how how easily can they adjust? And th thinking about like the DAOs I've been a part of, I see how intentional it is at the beginning and then how quickly it can go in like all these awesome, exciting directions and kind of relies on the mobility and the agility of small teams. So how can like a 20,000, 200,000 person company make that infrastructure adjustment to, to really stay competitive? Slowly but surely, you know, I think the Innovator's Dilemma is a great book to read on this topic. You know, the reason why I'm so long on this space is these companies are built on fundamentally different technology. And that's not to say that other companies can't adapt to that. But the systems that are being created today allow for upgradability in a way that has never been possible before. And so as a large company trying to adapt it, I really do think it's about carving out a new division and a new product line because it's going to be very difficult to, to implement this in the systems that exist today. I have a question that was passed to me from someone in a DAO I'm a part of that this person couldn't make it to the call. But uh, so we're part of the Krause House. It's a DAO with the goal of buying an NBA team. Uh, Love it. Very, very exciting goal. And this is obviously like a long term project. We're not going to call the commissioner of the NBA tomorrow and be able to buy the Portland Trail Blazers. So as we think long term about DAO infrastructure, we're curious what like practices in DAOs or tokenomics that exist today might break off or die within the next five to 10 years. Like what assumptions are we currently making about DAOs that 
like we shouldn't be making and how will reality set in? It's a good question. I'll start by giving Kraushaus a quick shout out for going through Seed Club. That's an incubator program that I'm very, very involved with. So it's an awesome project. I love the team there. I think they're doing fantastic work. I think abstracting away the complexity of involvement in DAOs is really important. So recognizing that 90% of the people in your DAO are probably not going to contribute at all. 9% are going to be very lightly involved and 1% are going to do the vast majority of that work. I think it's about trying to reorganize attention, and allowing people to contribute at a meaningful level in a very easy way. And so when I think about things that are going to be replaced, I think that, you know, these onboarding flows where you have to sign up with a bot on Discord and you have to have a MetaMask wallet, um, it's really going to all start to compartmentalize into something that's very rolled up in full service. And so for now, I think being aware that things are very fragmented, but have good intentions and then looking for opportunities for your community to really build out custom products and services that support your needs is going to be the way that I see these things evolving over five years. Trippy Crypto.1 asks, sorry if you answered already, but where's the best resource to get started and how did you specifically get started in joining DAOs? Best resources to get started would be Forefront, NFT Now, and Daily Ape. These are three newsletters I highly recommend. If you're more into DeFi, Bankless has a fantastic podcast and newsletter. The Defiance, an incredible media outlet. And I think um, more under the hood, join a Discord community. You will learn far more from being in the mix of a Discord community than you will about reading things retrospectively. But if you're getting started, you know I like to say that Forefront is basically the DAO port of entry. And there are now dozens of outlets to be able to learn on a very meaningful level. For me personally, I joined the DAO ecosystem by working my way into the communities that I was passionate about, specifically one called MetaCartel, which is a grant giving organization. I was doing interviews of different members of the DAO, founders of the DAO. I was doing recaps of different grants that we were distributing. And so I found a way to really bring value to the table. And at the time I did not have 10 ETH to contribute to join. And so I was just really active and I just showed people I cared a lot and that allowed me to get my foot in the door with a lot of these projects. So my takeaway there would be you don't need large amounts of capital to get started. All you need is time and energy. And if you find a community that you really, really love, just keep banging at the door, you know, keep showing that you're here to add value. And I think one day you're going to wake up and notice that you're now on the Dow's payroll and doing a meaningful role in that community. From Richie, how would you characterize the current state of collaboration slash productivity software for DAOs? Uh, very human centric and very clunky. I think that a lot of the tools people are using to coordinate in the DAO space are very much happening in Zoom calls. Um, they're using like traditional tools like Figma. You know, I think that a lot of the actual work itself is happening off chain. And then a lot of the results of that work is being solidified on chain. So a lot of the stuff you see today is that working groups will form in a Discord server. They'll set up a little video call online or a Zoom call online or something to do most of the work. But then as they want to formalize that engagement, they'll then push that up to something like a snapshot to get it done. But a lot of the work in between is happening in very traditional community sense. And I think the biggest difference is that work is now happening on Discord rather than on Slack. And the result of that is that those conversations are much more open and collaborative, which allows more voices to chime in. And every now and then you find this sort of all-star contributor lurking in the shadows. And I think that one person poking in and becoming a major role in the community is the exact reason why this uh, tooling and this framework is so important. And we have a great last question to take us out with, which is, this is from Taki. Just to ground the conversation, what is a use case for DAOs at Google? A use case for DAOs at Google? You know, honestly, I don't use email anymore. Or I try not to use it. So this might be the bad uh, person to, to ask a question to, but I would say more, more crypto native chat communication software. You know, right now when I am interacting with um, my on-chain protocols, a lot of the time that communication is happening on Web2 platforms. So things like Telegram, things like a Discord server, things like a discourse forum. You know, I see Google as sort of the main place for day-to-day -day communications. And I would be really fascinated by products that allow communities to have more meaningful discussions together. So similar to the discourse forums that exist today, what does it mean for communities to come together and have open discussions and job boards around their work. And if Google can build a compelling product around that, I think that people would be very open to utilizing it. Yes, we'll just move on to the last perfect question to take us out, which is what are recent DAO projects you're excited about? Awesome. Good question to start. I will say that in the past two weeks, I have spent time with so many DAOs that I could go on for about 10 minutes on the subject to quickly rattle some ones off the top of my head. Um, Friends with Benefits is the one that I spend the most time on. This is a culture crypto community that's really challenging what it means to be part of an online community. Um, Seed Club is a project that is working with creators to help launch tokens and DAO ecosystems. They recently announced a cohort of about 
15 really, really killer projects that are all poking around in the space. Highly recommend taking a look at that. They'll probably be the next wave of DAOs that are worth paying attention to. The Forefront community, which is the DAO port of entry, I'm really fascinated by. Pleaser DAO, which is ultimate cultural collector DAO that's doing some really amazing work. Uh, Bankless DAO is doing phenomenal work if you're into the DeFi space. And then Fingerprints, which is a very sophisticated DeFi collection DAO. And the last one I'll call out is um, you know, this, this thing I do called FireEyes, which is basically token and governance workshops. So if you're looking to poke around in the space, looking to launch a DAO or do any sort of governance tooling, you know, please keep me in mind. I have a group of uh, collaborators that I work with actively to help people get involved in the space and do really meaningful work. That is an excellent place to end it. Cooper, thank you so much for joining. There's so many things to do here. Normally, I would ask for just a generic listing of articles people should check into, but I really recommend reading pretty much everything Cooper wrote. Very comprehensive. I'm always fascinated by the fact that, to your point about writing being your entry point into the community, getting good at communicating ideas is just such a value add for folks. So that would be my main suggestion to everybody. But any closing words you have, Cooper? No, I would say if you're listening to this conversation, you made it this far, I think you're in the exact right place. You know, it's my belief the next three months in crypto are going to be monumental, but then there will be a refresh period of about three to five years where we really re-examine the core nature of this ecosystem. So if you're thinking about getting involved in the space, I would really challenge you to take the, the next three months to spend a lot of time and energy looking into it, but be prepared for there to be a transition period here for you to make a meaningful wave in the space and just be aware of what's happening. You know, it's a fun time to be alive. I've never felt better. I think that across all these communities, you're noticing people are really happy. And so I'm just excited to have the opportunity to talk about it. And I look forward to helping everyone else too. I'm going to steal another 30 seconds of your time because you cheated and you said something fascinating at the end of the episode. How did you come up? So three months is the end of the year. Where, how do you, why do you think of like basically the rest of 2021 and then a three to five year period? Complete vibe check. I mean, you look at 2017, the cycle that happened there. I think we're going to go through pure euphoria. You look at these NFT markets that are happening right now. It's absolutely off the chain. It's extremely fascinating, but it's also extremely unsustainable. So I expect there to be a period of high growth where everyone's freaking out and losing their mind about crypto. But as you start to look under the hood at things that we talked about, like onboarding, things like getting into these communities and getting started, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on the maturity side for these organizations. So I expect that we're going to get everyone in the world aware of crypto this run. And then in the next three to five years, we'll actually have the infrastructure in place to allow them to use it on a day-to-day -day basis. All right, everyone. Timer's set. Three months to go. Let's go. All right, Cooper, thank you so much for joining us and giving a bit of extra time. Thank you very much. This is a pleasure. I look forward to talking again soon.